But if you have your Bibles, uh, turn open to the book of Romans. Uh, I believe it's around, if, you ever, if you're using a pew Bible, I believe it's around like 940, I think. Um, if not, just find the New Testament. And if you find Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John, just keep going uh, to your right until you get it and find Romans 3. Romans chapter 3. We've been preaching uh, the righteous one revealed uh, for a while now. And uh, if you've made it to this particular Sunday, uh, I want to, grad- I want to congla- con- congratulate you. Uh, we've had lots of graduations recently of our, some of our high school seniors and our college grads and such. And this morning, if you've been with us through the book of Romans, you're now graduating. You're graduating out of the judgment of God, and you're into the justification of Christ. How about that? You're, you're excited about that? And it's, it's good for you to sit in the, in the judgment of the Lord as, as the Bible reveals it. It's good for us to understand that. It's good for us to know that He is perfectly righteous and He is perfectly good to judge. But it's also good to hear of His freedom. So if you've been with us, right, uh, you've heard that of God's righteous wrath being revealed uh, because we exchange our immortal glory for that which is mortal, uh, we have learned, that's, that's uh, Romans 8, uh, 1, 18 through 23. We have learned that his judgment, in his judgment, he gives, uh, the, gives the Gentiles up to, their, uh, to the lusts of our hearts and to our dishonorable passions and to our debased minds. We've heard that he has judged uh, rightly uh, his people for uh, the practice of sin and the presumption upon himself just to not care that sin exists in our lives, that we're entitled in some way, shape, or form to His salvation. We've learned that His judgment has come from seeking our own glory through our own works instead of seeking His glory through His final work. We've learned that He judges our secrets. He, we've learned that He judges our hearts for trying to keep the law to earn salvation, and we have learned last week even that only God's heart is righteous enough to judge. There's much to be learned in the judgments of the Lord. And so as we look at chapter 3 this morning, verses 19 through 21, we are going to see that Christ himself is the just judge But he is also the justifier of our souls. He's the just judge, but the justifier of our souls. Look at verses verses 19 through 26 with me as I read them to you. It says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works... The law, uh, of the law, no human being will be justified in his, the Lord's, sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. King Jesus is both the just judge and the justifier. 
Let's look at it in three ways. The, first, in the passage in three ways. The first is, God's law reveals judgment for sin, right? This is sort of the concluding, the concluding, concluding? The concluding verses, right? The concluding verses for, for this whole section on God's judgment. And what it teaches more is that the law has something to say, right? Now we know that whatever the law says. It has nothing to say. It's the, well, there's, there's substance to the law of God. What is that substance? What is the law teaching us? Well, it's revealing to us. It's showing us God's righteousness by showing us God's nature and character. When you read the Old Testament laws, you are seeing God's perfect nature and character revealed. And His nature is holy. And His character is faithful. And, and that is in opposition to us. Right? Our nature and is, not, is, is unholy. And our character is to be unfaithful. This is what the law has to tell us over and over and over again. So, for we, so, then, so then we know that whatever the law says, it also speaks to those who are under the law. It's, a, it's a, the first, what he said, what it says is the substance of it. What it speaks is this active delivery of the substance. Who's it talking to? Man, it's talking to those who are under the law. Well, who are those people? Well, as the, the context of, of, of Romans 1, 19 through 3, uh, 19 and 20 right here, uh, there's two groups of people. There's the Gentiles, right? The Greeks of Romans 1. And, and as I just uh, referred to a minute ago, we remember that God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts, their dishonorable passions, their debased minds, to do what ought not to be done. And this is sort of summed up, if you have your Bible in front of you, just sort of flip, flip one page back. It's summed up in Romans chapter 1, verse 32. And it says, Though they know God's righteous decree, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This is what the law says. This is God's righteous decree. You deserve to die. And, and it's, they, don't have, and, and, you know, they don't have the law like this, but clearly in chapter 2, verse 15, it tells us that they have the law written on their hearts. So they stand accountable. All the Gentiles, everybody who's not a Jew, is under the law of God, but also the Jews themselves are under the law. And as we've talked about in days past, the Jews have a special place because they are the ones who receive the law, right, from Yahweh himself through Moses and are corporately in relationship with God, Yahweh God, in order to reveal him as the one true God to the rest of the world. And about them, right, Paul writes that all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For, it's not, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. And as we learned in chapter 2, that they are, they are not obeying the law. The Jews aren't obeying the law, but rather they are practicing the same things that they judge the Gentiles for. So the law then has something to say about the substance of who God is and who man is. And the law has that thing to declare, that declares that substance so we know that we are justly judged. We deserve to die. And by that law, right, that judgment come to us because the law has something to do, right? Continue to look in the scriptures right there, right? They're under the law. Why? so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Right? In light of Christ's righteousness, whatever it has to say will only reveal that the law speaks the truth, that he's holy and faithful and that I am unholy and unfaithful, that you are unholy and unfaithful outside of Christ. The law stops us in our tracks. It keeps us from from back talking, Lord, did you ever get in trouble with your mom? I know you did somewhere. Maybe you still do. But you, you did that wrong thing and, you're, and you're, you got caught and, and maybe it was your mom, maybe it was your father, but they were, they were recounting your sin to your face right there, right? They were telling you what it is that you did wrong. 
And then some of your mothers concluded this way. Now, what do you have to say for yourself? Right, well, your, your head, like your head's all the way down to your ankles, right? You're just so, like you're so low, like you, you just, you, you know you've done wrong. You've been caught red-handed. What do you have to say for yourself? Man, you don't have anything to say for yourself. Your mouth is stopped. And you know that if you have anything to say for yourself at that moment, more trouble is going to incur upon your life, right? You have plenty of trouble. What do you have to say for yourself? Nothing. Ah, well, the Lord gave us moms because it's a sign, right? It's a foretaste because there's not just a mom. There's a real judge. There's a real judge. His name is Jesus. And when you stand before him, he will show you who you are in relationship to his perfection. And if he were to ask, I don't know, what do you have to say for yourself? You'll say nothing. I will say nothing. Because it will be plain to me and everybody else that he is God and I am not. In fact, the whole world will be held accountable. Right? Chapter 2, verses uh, 6 and 9 says, He will render each one according to his works. Right? That's how we know we judge for our sins. And he says, There will be tribulation and stress for everyone who does evil, first the Jew and then also for the, also for the Greek. Right? That's the whole world. The whole world will be held accountable. The law says something to us, and the law does something to us. But there is something the law cannot do for you. The law cannot justify you. It cannot put you in a right relationship with God in God's sight. All this language that you are reading in Romans 3 right now is this legal language. So we're not talking about a familial relationship, like in, when being justified before God. We're not yet talking about familial relationship, though we, the Bible does give us that in relationship to God. It's not talking about a, a, a platonic relationship or a friendship in that sense, though the Bible does give us that image about God and his people. We're not talking about the intimate friendship of uh, a relationship, right? A positional relationship of husband and wife or bride and groom. But the Bible does give us that between God and his people. But that's not this language. This language is this legal language that we are in a positional standing before God. And before God, there's only two categories of people. Not Jew and Gentile, but unrighteous and righteous. That's the only two kinds of people. And either you are under the law or you are under God's grace. Either you are trying to do it on your own and you're trying to speak for yourself, to justify yourself by your actions, by your works, by your deeds, and the law will shut you up. Or you are standing under grace. So when that same judgment comes on your life, you have someone to stand in the gap for you so that when you can't talk, one who is righteous can speak on your behalf. You and I are either objects of God's wrath or you are objects of God's mercy. You are either unrighteous or you are positionally righteous in Christ. That's the only two options. See, the law has just revealed the standard Right? It's a, I know I'm a bit repetitious this morning, but it shows, the law shows God's perfect holiness and complete faithfulness in our inability to keep the whole law perfectly, which is what you are required to do, is what I am required to do. Because the standard isn't relative to the rest of the world. The standard isn't relative to what I'm capable of. The standard isn't relative to anything else except relative to Christ's holiness and perfection. And the law shows our complete sinfulness and our perpetual faithlessness. That's where our heart is. What do you do with that? You believe it. <laughs> you, you accept it. You, you, you come to conclude that there is a life after this one, that this is not all there is. 
That's a hopeless state of being if you think this is all that exists. There is more. There is, a, there is an everlasting world. There's an everlasting life. There's an everlasting beauty with Christ and an everlasting judgment in hell that exists. You believe this. And you stop measuring your holiness and your goodness or your own righteousness by any other standard other than God's. If you have any other rubric to measure your own goodness, any other standard, right? then you should throw it off. And today's the day of salvation. Today's the day that you accept the Lord's standard for righteousness, Jesus Christ. Today's the day that you take up a new measuring rod of goodness. And when you encounter that measuring rod of goodness, who is Jesus Christ, the first thing it will do is it will humble you because it will expose who you are first which is a kind of humbling, but there's a deeper humbling than just to see your own heart. And the deeper humbling is that the perfect one would die in your place. The deeper humbling is that the King of kings and Lord of lords would justify you, would give you his goodness. And you and all of a sudden, for the first time, you realize how undeserving you are of such an unbelievable gift. But that humbling will take you all the way to a broken and contrite heart. The humbling of your sin and the humbling of that beautiful gift. But once you get to that bottom, once you get that humble and contrite heart, all of a sudden there's this transformation that begins to take place in your life and there's a new kind of joy. There's a new kind of freedom. A joy and freedom that's found in the deliverance of your soul, of your life, from death. You see, it's Christ's righteousness. It's God's righteousness that reveals the justification for sinners. Right, that's that verse 21. I love everywhere in the Bible where there is the divine conjunction. I love the term but where something bad is taking place and then there's this divine conjunction, but. And that means that something is coming your way that is from the Lord that changes all the bad stuff you just read. Now, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested, has been revealed. You can now see it in a new way, in a better way. And that manifestation is apart from the law, though the law and the prophets bear witness to it. See, the God's righteousness reveals a justification for sinners. How is the righteousness revealed? Apart from the law, it, it's, the, the righteous revealed is not completely new in that sense. It's not completely untethered, but it's just not dependent on the law, nor is it under the law's judgment. You see, the law had witness. The prophets had witness about the righteousness to come. Right, we, we see it in Genesis because Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteous. We see that by faith it comes. We, we see in Deuteronomy 18, there's a better prophet than Moses to come. There's somebody greater, and Hebrews picks that up and says there's, a, there's, a, there's one greater than Moses. Christ is greater than Moses. The, the prophets pick it up. Listen to Isaiah 53 this morning. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, the Messiah to come, the suffering servant to come. God has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. And the will of the Lord shall prosper his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, the suffering servant, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge, shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. Doesn't that sound like 
like, like Abraham? accounted righteous? And doesn't it sound like Romans where we're justified by faith? It's right there. He'll make many to be accounted righteousness and he, the suffering servant, will bear our iniquities, will bear our sin. This is this righteousness that's manifested what kind of righteousness is revealed? How, how is it revealed? Well, it's revealed apart from the law. It's, it's revealed through the, through the law and the prophets, but not under it, not by it. What, what kind of righteousness is revealed? It's right there in the text. It, verse 22, it's the righteousness of God. God is the source of it. It's the righteousness that's through faith. That's the means of it. That's the means of the righteous, we believe. It's the righteousness that's found in Jesus Christ. He's the object of it. Faith in anything else will be revealed as incapable of justifying you. But then when you see Jesus, you're like, oh, oh, that's the way. That's the truth. That's the life. That's the one who has the righteousness I long for. That's the one that will give me the righteousness I long for. That's the one who re reputes me when I say, I'll earn my righteousness. He rebukes me and he, he moves out of the way. He's like, no, no, I will give it to you for all who believe. It's the kind of righteousness that's of God through faith in Christ for those who will believe. We're the subject of it. We are those who are in need of what we don't have. Do you see yourself that way? Do you understand this righteousness of God through faith in Christ? For anyone, for anyone, any Greek, any Jew, any Gentile, any person, all the nations, it's for them if they'll just believe. How is this righteousness then, right? If it's revealed apart from the law, if, it's, if this righteousness, if the kind is the source, it's out of God and in Christ for those who believe, how is it applied to those who believe? How do we receive this righteousness? Well, we've got to admit that we've sinned. Right? Uh, again, only two groups of people in the context of our passage, Jew and Greek. That's everybody. It covers the whole world. And, and, and in verse 19, right, the, the, whole, the whole world be held accountable. And what it says is that all have sinned. This is that past tense, that, that this completed action. Everybody has sinned. There's not one who has not sinned. And it speaks to original sin in terms of we were born of Adam. Right? We were born of our first parents and we, we can't do anything but not sin. It's who we are. And then it tells us that because we've sinned, we fall short of the glory of God. Interesting. Right? For a couple reasons. One, here's the aim. Here's the reason you were created. Here's your end game right here. The glory of God. Do you, do you wake up in the morning? I mean, right? You wake up in the morning. You've slept well. You've slept lousy. Doesn't matter. You still got to get on with the day. And you just go and you look in the mirror, right? And you, you're you know, you're trying to get it out of your eye and you're thinking about how your hair is going to get done and you're like, you know, you can kind of see your breath, right? When you, when you see that in the mirror, is, does, the, does the phrase, ah, for the glory of God, come to your mind? <laughs> nah. But by the time you get yourself ready to go, and you're already in the car to work or you're already getting the kids out the door or you're already on to help your neighbor or whatever the case may be, you, you still haven't had time to think about the glory of God. And by the time you get to 11 o'clock, you're just trying to figure out what's for lunch and then you eat your meal 
And you get done with your meal, but you got to get back to work and back to your stuff. By the time that gets done, you, you've got to get ready for the evening. It's like, it's like it, whether you're preparing for your family, you're preparing for yourself, or you gotta get, i got to get dinner in there somehow, and, and i got to finish things off for the evening. And then I'm just tired, right? I mean, it's 8.30, 9 o'clock, and I'm tired. I'm either going to go crawl in bed, or i got more to do till 10.30, and then we'll be more tired. And you lay your head down on the pillow, and what's your, what's your last thought? Ah, all for the glory of God. Probably not. You probably probably lay down and pull them up and be like, survived. (laughs) Barely. (laughs) I just made it. But the scriptures are trying to tell us that we're made for something more. The scriptures are trying to tell us that we're made for something more than the American dream or anybody else's dream. The scriptures are trying to tell you that you're made more than just for your family. The scriptures are trying to tell you you're made for more than just your bank account. The the, the, the scriptures are trying to tell you more that you're made for the approval of your boss or your friends. You're made for something more. You're made for the glory of God. That's why you live. And the problem is you fall short of it. And and the, the, the tense here is this present tense. Well, all have sinned is this past and completed action. This fall, this, this fall short of is this continual action that's taking place. Day by day by day, I am falling short of the glory of God. Sure does leave me hopeless, doesn't it? It sure does until you read the next line in verse 24, you, as you fall short of the glory of God, you are justified by his grace as a gift. And while it says you see it, you are justified, that's still not past tense, that you are justified. You are being just, it's still present tense. It's continual action. And the Lord is giving us this great picture this morning that as we are going through our day and we are perpetually falling short of the glory of God, he is perpetually justifying our lives so that we can be in his presence forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. 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 That's the good news of Jesus Christ. Remember Psalm 23? You familiar with that one? I'm sure you are. You know, you know, remember how it ends, right? What's following you around in Psalm 23? Anybody know? Call it out. It's, you're trying to think about it. You're, you're, trying, you're, you're, like, you're like, the Lord's my shepherd. I shall not want. And then you got to it. His goodness and his mercy. Right? Surely his goodness and mercy will follow you around all day's life. What does that mean? I'll tell you what it means. I'll tell you at least in part what it means. It means the justification of your life. Jesus Christ is following you around. This, this right here, this 23 and 24, is the theological form of the metaphor in Psalm 23. Goodness and mercy is following you around all the days of your life. The Lord's perpetual justification, his goodness to do it, and the mercy it takes in spite of your sin follows you around day by day so that you can perpetually be for the glory of God the Father. Amen! He is following you around. He is forgiving your sins. He is erasing your tracks. And he is placing you in right standing before the Father so you might be justified in Christ when you are judged. Woo! This is grace. I just described for you what grace is. You don't deserve any of that. In fact, it tells us right there that it's a gift as, by his grace. You're justified by his grace as a gift. And it is not like a birthday gift. It is like a heart transplant. And it is not a heart transplant so that you have somebody else's pumper to give you a few more years of your life here on earth. It is a divine heart transplant so that you can have everlasting life with him. You have got to start living on a spiritual plane first. I'm not saying be detached from this world. We live in this world. The Lord gave us this world. We are witnesses in this world. We have a job to do. But you have to live your life first on the spiritual plane of God and the unrighteousness we live in before him and the righteousness he gives us forever and ever and ever. This is grace. How? Okay, pastor, you've preached this thing, but how are you confident that this is true? 
how are you confident this is true? Everybody's believing something. Everybody's proclaiming something. Why is this the final word? Well, because of verse 25. The redemption's in Christ Jesus. And God the Father put God the Son forward as a propitiation, as a, as a substitutional atoning sacrifice. A propitiation by His blood. It's almost redemptive. Propitiation has this idea of sacrifice which would entail blood. But now he's, He wants to make it really, really clear. It's this atoning sacrifice by His blood and it's to be received by faith. I'm confident of this because it's through the meaning of Christ's death. If Christ's death is meaningless, I don't. We should. We're, we're, we're meeting here in vain. But the meaning of His death is that it is replaced. Even even if you were here this morning, and I don't believe this at all, but even if you were here this morning and you thought everything in the Bible was a metaphor, everything was symbolic, everything was fable, even the fable would tell you that the reason Christ died was so that it would be in place of those who couldn't die for themselves. That would be the meaning of it. And that's and there's nothing else like that. There's no other world religion like that. There's no other, there's no other uh, story like that. But, but more than that, right? It's through the reality of Christ's death. Because I don't think it's a fable. I don't think it's a myth. I don't think it's made up for political reasons. I think it's historically true. He died. In fact, all, like all the scholars say there was a man in history who named Jesus died. All of them say there's a man who named Jesus who died. All of them say that. But I don't think he just died. I think, he, I think the meaning is real. I think, and I, and I think the, the reality is real. And I'm confident because the reception of Christ's death. I'm just, I just need to tell you once again that I came to a place in my life where I realized the depth of my sin. And I want you to know that, and, and, and I came to the place where only God could save me from that death. And I cried out to him and he delivered me. And I want you to know that ever since that time in my life, I've only come to know a deeper sense of my sin against the Lord. And he is only following that up with a deeper display and demonstration of his love on the cross that says he overcomes my sinfulness. That's the testimony of our church because that's the testimony of the gospel. We've said it in our internship all week this week, at least, at least a handful of times, until you understand, or for every time that you understand the depth of your own sinfulness, you now have the opportunity to see the, a, a deeper place of Christ's love for your life. This is Christ's righteousness revealed do you believe? It's received by faith. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You just receive it. If you are here this morning and you are walking around in this life and, and you don't know where you're going, you don't know what's really going on, or, or if you know exactly what you're doing and exactly where you're going, but God's just not a part of it, then I want to tell you this morning that this is the way. Christ is the way. Then you neither need to, like, you are lost and need to be found and have new purpose and new hope and new life, or you think you, are, you think you have found your truest self, and this morning reveals to you that your truest self won't get it done. And you would lose your life in that sense in order to gain Christ. You don't have to stay lost. You don't have to stay in your sin. You don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to accomplish it so God will give you approval. You receive it by faith. Precisely because God's sacrifice reveals the person of Jesus Christ who is the just and justifier. Look at this super unbelievable verse in the second half of 25 and 26. God put forward as a propitiation his son to show 
to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. But in this present time, it's, he's the just and the justifier. So when you, when you read this second half of 25, all of a sudden, he's giving you the reason he did this. He's, he's, he's saying, why, why did he do this? Well, it's because it used to be one way and now it's another. Now, let me, let me see if I can help us understand this this morning. Theologically, theologically, biblically speaking, people have been saved the same way since the beginning of time, by faith. The Old Testament people are looking forward to a deliverance they do not know. I don't think Moses had Jesus in his head. I don't think David had Jesus in his head. I think he had a lineage in his head, but not Jesus himself. I, I, the, the prophets are the closest people to understanding Jesus at all just by virtue of the passage earlier, just by the suffering servant passages. But I don't think they have this kind of Messiah in their head because, they're all, because the Old Testament is tied to the land and they're all looking for ultimately this, this better King David to rule over everything, which ultimately past this life is true. Christ comes back, he returns, he reigns. It's new heaven, new earth, he rules over it all. But we're just not there yet. So when Christ comes, right, the, so the Old Testament is looking forward to this way. But everybody, so and we, we, we look back on Christ the, the, from, from the church at Acts, right, on forward. We are looking back on Christ. They can't see it as clearly as we do, but they believe by faith. We see it more clearly, and we also believe by faith. But it's the same grace and faith that saves both me and Abraham, that saves you and, and Adam. It's the same, same faith. But this isn't speaking theologically as much as it's speaking experientially, right? Because, because in divine forbearance, he had passed over the former sins. What he means is he doesn't, while in time, while outside of time and space, the cross is good for Moses and for David and Abraham, no doubt. But in time and space, that cross event hasn't happened yet. So the experience of people is that God looks over their sin, passes over their sin. It's why we read this thing, which obviously the Passover points to the perfect sacrifice. But for them right now, he's passing over their sins. But verse 26 then repeats, right? The, the 25, second half of 25, this was to show God's righteousness. Verse 26, it was to show his righteousness. So the propitiation of verse 25 by his blood to be received by faith was to show God's righteousness. To show divine forbearance, right? In the past, but... But now in this present time, so that he, Jesus, might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, now instead of being passed over, it's in place of. Experientially, instead of being passed over, it's in place of. The Jews had this idea of in place of in terms of the sacrificial lamb and the scapegoats and those sorts of things. But, but the scripture is telling us that this is, he's passing over the sins. Here, right here, he's telling us, he's telling us so the just and the justifier can be revealed. So that you can see the righteousness of God in Christ and it's okay for him to judge. But you can also see the death of Jesus Christ so that you can see he is the one who stands in your place and justifies you before the Father. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Do you believe it? Have you given, have you given it an, an honest look to figure out what this world really means? Have you, have you cried out to him saying, I don't know what I'm doing, but I need something. Would you, would you speak to me? Would you save me? Jesus Christ is the only way.
Would you trust him? Would you follow him? Would you die to yourself and live for his glory alone? In Christ, we no longer fall short of the glory of God, run into the glory of God. Follow Jesus.